Well, we're back for another week in this Bible survey that we've been doing over the past uh, 29 weeks. We're at week uh, 30, and then we have next week. It's amazing how quick we've been in the, or how fast this is going. I hope you're, you're excited to worship God this morning and anticipating uh, encountering Him in a very intimate way. With that being said, let's just stand and let's just spend some time singing to Him from our hearts. And then we're going to spend some time in the Word looking at Paul and uh, understanding a little bit more about who Paul was and how he was a church planter and how he wrote to these churches to, to help them function as the church that, that God has called them to be. And so I pray that you, again, that you're excited and anticipating encountering God in a very intimate way. Let's worship Him and exalt Jesus. Today, no matter where you are gathered, or how many you're gathered with, you are still His church. You are still His church. God's love hasn't changed. It is unending. It is infinite. It is deep. And believe when I say His love has power today. Power to free you, heal you, and to fill you. And restore you. God's mercy hasn't changed. He keeps no record of wrong. And His mercy is new every morning. The cross hasn't changed. It's still there for you and for me, no matter who you are or what you've done. This is what we need to be reminded of today. That wherever two or more are gathered in His name, Jesus is standing in our midst. This means the church hasn't changed. The church isn't a building. It is you and I together, with the Spirit of God living in us, living through us. So today, as we come together, as we worship. Let us be reminded that we are still His church. God is here with us right now. And no matter what your past looks like or how scary your future may be, you can trust God. You can trust God. And because He is here with us, we have everything we need today. We are still His church. We are still His church. We are still His church.
shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God An almighty fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against Again, we are in this 31-week series that I just can't believe. I know I said this last week, but I can't believe that we are on week 30. So we have this week and next week, and then we're wrapping up next week. Uh, it just amazes me how quick this time is going. But this has been such a fun journey. Many of you have responded to me and have talked to me about how much you've really enjoyed being in this 31-week uh, survey. So as we move forward after this, it's going to be a challenge to... Uh, engage in some series that um, I think not only teaches but also challenges us as well. Um, <clears throat> not that you can have teaching that doesn't challenge, I guess you could, but, but I, I think you understand my point. So where we've been, essentially, you know, we celebrated Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus. That was the, the prophecy being fulfilled, God's way of restoring uh, the relationship between Him and humanity. Um, something that we could not do on our own, that we can't do on our own. We can't live good enough. We can't uh, uh, give. We can't serve. We can't do any of those things good enough to, to restore that relationship between us and God. There is such a chasm between the separation between us and God, someone that is, that is infinite and we are finite, someone that is so holy and we're not holy. Um, <clears throat> and the only way that could be, could be restored or repaired or um, resolved is through um, God Himself uh, becoming flesh and taking our sins upon Himself and restoring that. What an incredible story that is. In fact, when you compare that to any other world religion, uh, it is, that is the separation. It's so vastly different. All the other religions you have to, it's about you being good enough uh, to appease the God that you serve. Our God is vastly different. Our God says, I will come to you and I will take upon your sin. I will take upon your sins and, and then freely give it to you. And so those of us that have accepted that free gift of grace and salvation, now we have a relationship with God. And that is only done through the work uh, of the promised Messiah that we have been reading about. God's upper story, how is He going to restore that? And that, that is how He's restored it, the plan of salvation, the gospel, the good news, is that God loves us so much that He, will, he became one of us, took our sins upon Himself so that we could have a relationship with Him. And so we just celebrated the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, you know, the, the, our salvation. And then uh, the, over the past couple of weeks, we talked about how Jesus ascended back to heaven. But before He did, He promised the Holy Spirit. He told the, His remaining 11 disciples to wait until uh, the Holy Spirit came. And then, uh, so that's what they did. The Holy Spirit came and just literally changed everything. Uh, these men that were scared now became very bold for the gospel of, uh, and telling people about Jesus. Just a complete turnaround of these individuals. 
And so, therefore, we, as, as we look at that, the Holy Spirit descended upon them. They go out with this message. Other people begin to believe. They begin to repent, receive the Holy Spirit. The early church is formed. The early church is birthed. And that's what we talked about. That's what we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks. So one key individual that we're going to talk about today is the Apostle Paul. Now, again, I, I, want to, I don't want to get into all this narrative about his name was Saul to begin with, but I'm going to refer to him as Paul. Okay, So uh, before he was a prosecutor or persecutor of Christians, he actually hunted them down to kill them. He was very passionate about the law. He grew up in the law. He was a very smart individual, very passionate about God, uh, but did not understand the 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 um, concept of, G of Jesus being God, right? And so he has this life-altering experience on the road to Damascus. He was actually going to hunt, he was actually hunting Christians down, going there to persecute, persecute some Christians, and he has this life-altering experience with Jesus Christ. He, um, fast forward, he becomes, abs just literally does a turnaround as well. Um, he becomes now, a huge advancer of the gospel. He now becomes so passionate about Jesus. He begins to understand all things and he becomes the message to the Gentile world, which means those are the people that are not Jewish. And so he goes and he begins to minister and, and plant churches. People, again, people where he would go, people would receive, repent, receive Christ, receive the Holy Spirit. And as they did, the early church again was, was being birthed. Now, here's, here's the, um, so as he goes into these other areas and regions, uh, people receive the free gift of grace, of salvation from God. They begin to form these local little bodies um, of churches. And so you have different churches like one in Ephesus, one in Galatia, Corinthian, Corinth, um, and so on and so forth. So Paul is, goes on three missionary journeys, plants all these different churches. And then what we read about Paul in the New Testament, we read his, uh, what we would call his pastoral letters and his, uh, or epistles and his prison letters. Um, he gets thrown in prison a little bit later on in his life where he would spend the rest of his time there until his death. Uh, but nevertheless, as he planted these churches, he then wrote to them. He would hear certain things happening and he would write to them, whether to be to correct their theology, to correct their thinking, or to clear up some uh, misconception or to deal with an issue that was happening within the church. He wrote to them about how to organize a church, how to organize leaders, uh, what these leaders should look like, their qualifications, um, what to do in different situations when you had someone in the church that was living in sin. How do you deal with that? Um, writing, again, to clear up their, their misconceptions of, of theology. So in church in Galatia, uh, that's one of the things that he wrote about was, how, did you, how have you once received the gospel and you believe, but now you're reverting back to works? You're, you're reverting back to the, what, the law, the way it used to be. Um, and so he would write to them and tell them, this is not correct. And, and, and he would say, this is what's correct. And in fact, in all of his letters, there's about five things themes that would, would uh, um, be uh, throughout his letters, about five things. Number one would be Christian conduct. Uh, what does it mean to be the moral living? Um, you know, what does that look like to be a follower, a believer? Because your conduct is different now. Your way of living is vastly different. The second thing would be creed, and we're going to use all C's here. Creed, which is theology, which is your orthodoxy, what we believe. Third would be Christ. Um, you know, Christ is at the center. Christ is the head, okay? The fourth thing would be the church, and I just kind of shared with you some of those things. Literally, the church, what does the church, how we organize ourselves as a church, um, what does leadership look like, who, you know, think, the qualifications of individuals leading a church. And then the last thing would be Christ's coming, His second coming, okay? Um, what, that, what that means and looks like. And so those five things, those five themes would be interspersed throughout all of his letters to some degree. However, in his writings, um, in the letters, one of them, one of those themes would, would take more precedence because he was writing to an issue. For instance, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he was dealing with Christian conduct. If you've ever read those letters, uh, there was someone that was living in sin, sexual sin, and he was writing to them to tell them how to deal with that. 
uh, and then what to do if they repented or if they didn't repent, okay? In Romans and Galatians, it dealt with that, those, those two letters dealt more with the creed, more theology, you know, what that looks like, you know, what we believe, what is truth. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon dealt with Christ, Christ being the head, Christ being the center of all things. First and second Thessalonians would be, would be about Christ's second coming. These people repented, uh, they believed in Jesus, and then they kind of just sat down and they were like, okay, we're just going to wait till Jesus returns. And Paul's like, wait a second, that's not what this is about. You got to get up, work, live your life, you know, live your life. You don't just sit down, live your life. Um, and then the last one, last two, le three letters would be first and second Timothy, as well as Titus. And those letters dealt with the church, the organization of the church, leadership. That's where we read about elders and deacons, the leadership of a church and the qualifications of those individuals and what that looks like. So you can see that those, those five themes are present and interspersed in all of his letters, but some of, but Within his letters, one of them would take one theme would take more precedence, if that makes sense, because he was dealing with an issue. So when you understand that, and you go to say like First and Second Corinthians, and you begin to read those letters, and you understand that Paul is writing to them and and trying to teach tell them about how to deal with Christian conduct within the church, that gives us context, and we're able to read that letter, those letters, with that in mind, which makes sense when you read them, and so forth and so on. So that, that's essentially, you know, the, the, what he was, you know, that was Paul, the Apostle Paul. He was a church planter, and then he um, began to um, write to them and help them understand how to function through, through uh, again, through conduct, through belief, uh, through um, understanding who Jesus is, how Jesus is at the center of all things, okay? Uh, his second coming, and then church, how we organize ourselves in the church. Now, again, we don't have time, as, as, as I've been saying, this is, this is a Bible survey, so we're really just hitting the main themes here. And we're, so right now we're looking at this, the early church. It's been birthed. Now it's taking shape. It's living out. But there were things that were happening within those, uh, in those uh, churches, uh, those bodies, those or, you know, organized bodies of believers. And we read in the New Testament Paul's letters to them and so, you know, helping them, giving them instruction, giving them um, giving uh, giving them um, you know information and uh, teaching them and helping them become the the people that that God has called them to be so with that being said what I'd like to do is just kind of give a snippet of of a church uh, in Ephesus a church in Ephesians there's a young guy there by the name of Timothy and he is he is the one that's leading that church and in in our reading over the week we read about that and we also read um, you know Paul, talking to Timothy that in the last days, if you remember in chapter 3, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 3, where he talks about, you know, in the last days, there's going to be some things happen. People become, they're going to become lovers of themselves. They're going to be um, just all kinds of stuff. And then he talks about, that's not, that sh that's not you. That's not you. You know, teach these, you know, the, you know the truth. Teach these things. And so as we look at this church in Ephesus, Paul writes to them, and I want to use this as an example because Paul is writing to this church and he's telling them about how to live. Uh, and again, Ephesus, we know, was in, uh, in the heart of Rome. Um, Rome was, uh, took things by force. Uh, Rome was, was the world conqueror at that time. Uh, they, were very, they ruled with a heavy hand. Uh, now, again, if you were a Roman and you lived within Rome and you obeyed them, everything was at peace, okay? Because they ruled with a heavy, heavy hand. And if you went against anything that they said, that they would, the boot would drop on you, right? That's where the whole cross came from, the crucifixion. Uh, and it was to demonstrate a torturous, torturous way to die. Uh, but by doing that, it discouraged people from going against Rome and going against their laws. Now, but if you lived according to their laws and their ways, everything was at peace. So there was a, it was kind of a bittersweet thing in a sense. But Ephesus was a church in the middle of that. And Paul's writing to them and telling them, hey, you can't live. And he's not telling them to rebel, but he's talking about moral conduct. He's talking about the way we should live as Christians. Rome was very much about self-centeredness. Rome was very much about uh, hedonism, about pleasures of life, about all of that stuff, which is really the antithesis of, of what Jesus taught. 
And so Paul's writing to them and saying, look, you can't go back to the old way. You can't go back to the old way. The old way is not the way God would want us to live, is not the way we should live as Christ followers. And so he's writing to this church in Ephesus. And, and I just wanted to use this, I think, uh, this letter um, as an example to show you how he's writing to a church and he's giving them instruction on how to live. So if you would go to Ephesians and we'll look at chapter one um, or chapter four, uh, um, chapter four, and we're going to look at verses uh, one through sixteen. But we're going to chunk it up a little bit here and break it break it down a little bit. We're going to I want to be able to show you this. And so in uh, in uh, chapter four, verse one and two, it says this: Therefore, I, meaning Paul, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. And then he says. And then he describes what that looks like. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, and accepting one another in love. Okay? Now, if you think about it, humility and gentleness, patience, accepting each other in love, can you see how that would have been completely against the culture in which they lived in Rome? Okay? The Roman culture. Okay? Um, it wasn't about gentleness. It wasn't about patience. It wasn't about doing things out of love. It was about force. It was about taking things over with force. It was about dealing with something right then and there. Not a sense of humility, but, uh, you know, but uh, gentleness, but strongness, you know? And that is, you can see that's the antithesis of the teachings of Jesus. And so he writes to them, and that's what he says. In the first, so in the first, um, the first few, ver couple verses here, what we see the, are these, what we would call relational ethics, okay? And let's look at the first one, humility. And, you know, as I said, Rome was about self. It was about hedonism. It was about what makes me happy, the pleasures of my, you know, the, my, my pleasures and feeding off those. And Paul's saying it's not about self. It's about humility. It's about denying and renouncing self-centeredness, okay? Um, you know, again, we're Humans are intended to be great through God, through the identity of God, through the identity of Jesus. We're intended to do something great, be something great, but not for ourselves. Not for ourselves, but for Jesus. And so, you know, it's, it's the, you know, that whole redirecting of self. It's denying of self. It's, it's laying ourselves to the side, denying ourselves, crucifying ourselves. You would, you'll read a lot in Paul's letters and, and for the sake of Jesus. And that's what he's saying. We renounce self-centeredness. Um, we don't seek, you know, it, it, it's often we, we seek respect and we want recognition. We want honor and we want authority. Um, but, but that's, those are the things that we have to surrender and sacrifice and to live for God and allow God to give us that, okay? Allow God to bless us with that, all right? So we are not at the center, but God is. So the first one is humility, gentleness. We must renounce harshness and violence, okay? Instead of being harsh, uh, lack of caring and receptivity and becoming violent, um, that's not how healthy relationships exist. Healthy relationships don't exist in fear, but they exist in gentleness. Us, you know, being gentle with un one another. Gentleness conveys this sensitivity, right? This desire not to harm. Patience. He, he goes on to say patience. And that, that's where we renounce the tyranny of our own agendas. Where, you know, the timing happens in God's time. Not our time, but God's time, where we surrender to that. And we, you know, we don't cave into this, you know, especially in our culture and even in Rome, this self, this, um, this uh, instant gratification, this, you know, but instead where we deny that and we, we, we have patience where we allow it to be in God's timing. The last one is tolerant in love. All right. Renouncing our rights. Yes, we have rights. And we hear that a lot today. And I, I get that. I do. I understand that. We have rights. We have rights. And we become so passionate about our rights. But it's not about demanding our rights. It's not about that. It's about, you know, it's about um, loving one another, being tolerant with other individuals. It doesn't mean you, they, you have to allow people to walk all over your rights. But sometimes you forego your rights for the sake of someone else, for the sake of loving someone else in. Loving is a choice, and it's, it's caring enough to give attention to people, okay? And again, th these are hard, right? These are relational ethics that are very hard, and Paul's writing to them to tell them, look, 
the way you've been influenced in Rome is not the way. It's this is the way about being hu- humble, being gentle, about being tolerant in love, about being patient. OK, and then he talks about having unity in the body in the church, in the body, in the collection of saints where they were coming together to worship. And in verses 3 through 6, he says this, diligently keeping what? The unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. And he goes on to say, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So this is it. If Christ has created peace, and given us unity, then unity has to be a part of our self-understanding. We are one with other people in Christ. We are one with each other in Christ. Whether we like that or not, we are one in each, with each other in Jesus Christ. So we exercise our faith. To exercise our faith is, is to exercise unity. We can't have Christ just to ourselves. We are all in this together. We cannot be mature Christians by ourselves. That's where we stress so much walking with someone else, being in a group where we can be authentic with one another, where we can speak to one another in love, uh, but iron sharpening iron, right? But that happens not by ourselves. That happens by, by opening ourselves up and becoming vulnerable and transparent which is very hard, but we're doing it in Christ. We are in this together, and, and that's, what, that's what brings unity. Unity doesn't mean sameness. That doesn't mean we all have to like the same music. We all have to like the same you know, um, foods or colors or what, whatever. <laughs> whatever. The way we dress, whatever it is. It doesn't mean we have to be the same. It means we are unified even though we're diverse. We're unified in Christ, not in the foods we eat, not in the games we play or the teams we root for or the music that we like and the, all these other things, but we appreciate and even celebrate each other's diversity, but we understand again that we are one in Christ. And that's what Paul's telling them. You are. This is unity. If you want to have unity, you've got to understand it's not about sameness, but it's about being diverse, but you are one in Christ. Okay, And unity, if I can, if I can wrap up with this one, Unity is not the goal per se. Unity is not the goal per se, but Christ is. Unity in Christ. Does that make sense? We could all be unified and be wrong. We could all unify and do something and you know celebrate being unified, but we could be absolutely wrong. So it's not about unity per se. It's about being unified in Christ. This uni- the unity that comes from a shared faith and a shared knowledge of Jesus Christ. All right? So it's not about preferences. It's not about likes and dislikes. It's about Christ. We are unified in Christ. Okay? And then in verses 7 through 10, he talks about a healthy orthodoxy. Okay? What that means. And again, this is where we talked about some theologies coming out now. And he says this, Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascend to mean except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is all the, also the one who ascended for above all, above all heavens, that he might uh, fill all things. So what he's saying is, again, the emphasis in this foundation for unity should determine the interest and literally shape our theology. We focus on the gospel and on what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. All right. Humility, if we could go back to those relational ethics, is required first in doing theology. Right. Um, And on and on and on. We have to, our theology has to be correct. Paul's saying your theology has to be correct. It has to be in Christ. It has to be in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the gospel. The focus is on the gospel and what God has accomplished, the Father has accomplished in His Son, Jesus. And then, if you could go to verses 11 through 13, he talks about how we live that out. Again, how we live that out. And he talks about, uh, and he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry to build up what? The body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Okay? He's saying, 
this is God has equipped us all. God has equipped us for, and He's given us gifts, He's given us talents, He's given us the abilities to do something, but for who? Is it for us? No, it's for to build up the body of Jesus Christ. So our gifts, and we touched on this a little bit last week, our gifts are given to us to build up each other, to build up and edify the body of Jesus Christ. Again, Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus, and he's saying, this is how it works. This is how it works. You've got to have these relational ethics here, okay? Gentleness, humbleness, um, tolerant love, patience. And we do this in unity, and that's going to create unity. If we're, Think about it. If we're all living in those relational ethics, it, it's going to create unity. It, it, it just is. We're going to be, because we're, we're there for the other person, we're not there for ourselves per se, right? But, but it's, it's, this, it, it's just this dynamic that, that works, that builds up the body of Jesus Christ. But he said, but it's about, it's unity, but it's about Christ. It's not just about for the sake of unity, but for Christ. We're all diverse. In fact, we've all been given different gifts. You know, all of us have different gifts, and collectively we come together. And this is what happens. If you don't exercise your gift for the body of Christ, it hurts the body. Think about it. I mean, we, we use the, he uses this example of the physical body, you know, the hand, the foot, the eye, that kind of stuff. We might, you know, again, you can't say, well, my thumb's not important, so just whack off my thumb because it won't affect me walking. But yes, but then I, I can't do other things with my hand. Everything contributes to the one purpose, and that is the unity, okay, for the entire body. And that's what Paul is teaching this, the, the church. And he's saying it's for, the, it's for Christ, it's for the body. So, Everyone is called to the same task. We talked about that last week. About we're about loving God, loving others. We're about you know teaching, baptizing. You know this is the tap, but it's for the exaltation of Jesus Christ, and it's and it builds and, and then for the body and it builds us. It builds us together. Okay, but we're all wired differently. We're all made up differently. We, we we're very not, we're not just diverse in our preferences and our likes and dislikes, but we're also diverse in the way God created us. But he did that to create diversity within the church so that we would all work together and be able to build each other up in unity. And we end with the gospel work in verses 14 and 16. And he says this. So again, if you're following the flow, you got these relational ethics. Um, let's just go back real quick. You've got these relational ethics. And then um, we have, it's, it's for the sake of unity, right? Unity in the body. And then it's got to start, though, with healthy belief, what we, you know, our faith, what our healthy orthodoxy, it has to be spot on. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul identifies this is why we do all of this based on this. And then, he, and then it says, he, he talks about it driving uh, the way we conduct ourselves in the church, the way we practice and live out our faith. Uh, I call that orthopraxy. You know, we live it out. We're, we're diverse. We've been given gifts. We're doing it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're all called to the same task. We're doing it in love. And it, it, it literally is the gospel at work. Verses 14 and 16. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. From the whole body fitted and knit together, every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So we're all living it out. This is where we got these relational dynamics taking place. We understand why we're doing what we're doing. We understand, um, you know, how it works. We're understanding how God has put us together. But here's the point. We're all, it's, it's, we're looking to Christ. Christ is the head. It's not me, it's not you, it's not others, it's not, we're part of this and we're here together, we're here to help each other grow, but we're doing it for the gospel of Jesus Christ who is the head of the body. He is the head. And so once we, if we understand that and we have proper orthodoxy and we're living it out properly, okay, we see the gospel at work and we're not going to be, we're not going to be, um, um, Persuade, we're not going to be deceived. We're not going, you know, as he writes in, in Romans chapter 12, where he talks about don't conform uh, to, the, to the 
philosophies of the world. I'm paraphrasing, you know what I'm saying? Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Understand truth, right? Second Timothy chapter three, where he talks about there in the end times, this is what's going to happen, right? Well, we we if we are mature in our faith, we're not going to be we're not going to buy into that stuff. We're not going to buy into the false premises and the philosophies of our world today. And believe me, we're hearing a lot of false premises of, of, of all kinds of things right now to the point where you look at that and you're thinking that he could have been writing that letter specifically to us in our world today and about the end times and about how things are just going to become so warped, right? But we understand what is right. We understand what is true. And because of that, we don't buy into that. We're not deceived. We're not tossed you know, back and forth by the waves, right? Blown by every wind of teaching. Well, that may be right. Well, that may be, no, we know the truth. We know the truth and we live it out. So Paul's writing this letter. So this is, I'm just, give, I just wanted to give you a, like a snapshot of, of the example of Paul writing to one of his churches to say, look, this is how it's supposed to function. This is how it's supposed to happen. And so we can kind of see, as I shared with you, those five different uh, themes that come through, we can see it being uh, flushed out in this letter to the Eph church in Ephesus. Spend some time just looking through this again, if you would, this week. And I pray that you understand, that you just um, see where, you know, see where Paul's coming from. And then spend some time in his other letters, too, to see uh, those other five themes come through. It's been great being with you. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you back here next week.